We have, it's, it's kind of an interesting link here because we have two international sports stars. We have yourselves here beside us. We have uh, yourself, Richie, TV pundit, an international mm -hmm. career a few years ago. Shane, Dublin GAA, a big announcement this week that we'll come to in a minute. And yourself, Elaine, too, and I know you're studying uh, psychology of this in Galway. So it's an interesting link because you yourself now, Richie, are working as a psychotherapist. Yes. And Shane, you're working as a life coach. So we've had a few transitions in the career, we'll come to that in a second, but I want to start off with yourself, Richie. Let's go way back, youth career, Millwall, we had uh, Leicester FC, Belvedere. Tell us all about sport at a youth level for you, first of all. I suppose sport for me when I was a teenager, it was the most important thing. It was the thing I most enjoyed doing, it's the thing I did more than anything else. Um, and in terms of a the life that I wanted to leave, or a career that I wanted to have, it, that was it for me. There was no real plan B, there was no thoughts to, to what I might do if it didn't work out. So I put all my effort and my focus into this, and it worked out really well for me. When I was 17, I moved out of my family home, left Dublin, moved to London on my own, and signed for a club called Millwall, which are in South London, and I stayed there for seven or eight really, really happy years. Um, and I got a hip injury then when I was 23, and battled away with that for 18 months. So. When I got to the age of 24, I retired, because I had to, and then I was left with a situation going, okay, right, I need to do something new. I've given no thought to doing anything else, now I need to. So uh, I started off in a load of different directions. Yeah, so and just to focus actually on the early years again, mm. Richie, so I mean, you had the chance of a lifetime. I'm guessing when we talk about life goals, that was probably yours achieved at that stage. So what was the ecstasy like? What was the feeling like when you were playing? You obviously worked very hard to achieve it, but when you actually achieved this goal at such a young age, how was that to deal with? It, it's very hard to put into words, actually. Like, I suppose anyone in the room now, if you, if you have a thing that you're more, most passionate about, more than anything else, or you enjoy doing more than anything else, and then you get to do it as a job. So you've no, you've no other thoughts, no other responsibilities other than doing the thing you love. Like that's indescribably a brilliant way to, to live your life. It doesn't matter whether it's football or anything else. But for me, it was football. So even just the day-to-day -day stuff of, of going to bed and the only thing I had in my schedule the next day was to get up and go training for two or three hours. Um, and then match days on the good days are brilliant. Like I was a striker, so on the good days, if you're winning, if you're scoring goals, crowds are singing your name, the newspapers are writing nice stuff about you. That's great. There is a flip side, and um, particularly at a club like Millwall, if you don't play well and you're not scoring goals and you're losing matches, the crowd are as quick to criticise it as they are to praise you, and they're very, very blunt and explicit with their criticism. So it, it, the, the bad days can be quite challenging. So you've got to work out a way, no more than if you're doing any other job other than football, or even if you don't have a job, you have to work out your own way of trying to deal with the good and the bad days in some kind of a consistent way, because both will come. And in the world of football, the, both can be quite extreme. Richie, that's difficult to deal with at any age. At our mm. age, that's hard to deal with, but you were so young at the time. Um, so from, you had these highs, you had these lows. So how did you deal with it? How did you cope with that? Looking back, I probably didn't cope with it very... I, I did my best, is the answer. But, I, I mean, I didn't really talk to anyone when I had the bad days, because I thought... I did that thing that a lot of people do. Do you know when you go... I, I can't really complain about my lot because there's loads of people who have it worse than me. Like, I'm a footballer, like, whoopity do, I'm having a bad day, so what? I'm, I'm living my dream, to use the phrase you use. So I, I, I could have maybe talked a bit more about the bad days when they were happening because I had a load of people around me who would have been really supportive and sound, but because I didn't tell them what I was going through, they would no opportunity to support me or be sound. So the, 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 the bad days probably were more difficult and lasted a bit longer because I didn't try to access any support. Yeah. Um, and speaking of these highs and lows, in terms of your own story, Richie, uh, we had Mark McGee named you as one of potentially one of the best central forwards he ever worked with in his career. And suddenly 2002 came along, Mick McCarthy, World Cup, all was looking great, all was looking strong, and something happened and it changed everything for you. What was that? It did, yes, yeah, but again, to go back to my teenage years, the one thing I wanted to do more than anything was to be a footballer and play for my country and in an ideal world play in a World Cup for my country, and, and all those things kind of nearly came about happening. In February 2002, we'd already qualified for the World Cup, and I got called up to a friendly. Um, there, was, there was four or five more friendlies between that one and the World Cup, and I knew it was between me and Clinton Morrison, the, one of the other players, to get the final spot in the squad. Um, and I played, and it was great. Best day of my life. All my family were there. It was Lansdowne Road. 
can't put into words what it was like. And then three weeks later, I hurt my hip in a league game for Millwall, um, which meant I had the surgery, which meant I couldn't go back to any of the other friendlies, which meant I had to forget about the World Cup, and a year later meant I had to forget about the career and give it up. So in that really short space of time, ridiculous highs, like fulfillment of a lifetime ambition to then as rock bottom as I could have been at the time, because I had my career taken away. So you were there, you were on the world stage, you were nearly on the world stage, as they say, and suddenly, I suppose for years, this is your focus, you're achieving it, you're getting your goals, mm. and suddenly, this really is the end for you. I mean, there's no more, this isn't something that's a, a year-long interview or two, this, this is you out of the, the field, out of the career. So what happens then? What happens the day after this? Suddenly, Richie goes back to his house. There's no more football in his life. That's all you probably knew for years. Mm. Where do you go from then? Well, I didn't have an answer to that question at the time, and I was quite afraid of even addressing that question. What I did, I, I, I just availed of any work opportunities that came my way. So I worked as a football agent for a while. I did some media work for a while. I went back to work with, some, uh, with the youth teams at Millwall for a while. I was finishing off a sports science degree at the time. So I, I was quite busy. But the best thing I did by a distance, and the thing I'm most grateful for doing more than anything else, it wasn't getting a job or meeting certain people. Or it was the day I decided to go to see a therapist. She was a sports psychologist. I remember at the time I would tell everyone I wouldn't tell anyone I was going to see one, because I thought, it's not a blokey thing to do. I don't need help, I'm a strong man. So I didn't tell anyone I was going, and, I, and a few years later, I would admit that I saw a sports psychologist, because I thought that's a bit more acceptable. And then years later, I said, no, actually, it was a therapist. I went to therapy, and I really openly and honestly talked about what it was like, and it did me the world of good. And it was so good that years later, even when I left her on the last session, I remember going, I think I'd love to do her job. Yeah. I think the little journey she's brought me from, from in this broken little wreck when I first met her, to leaving several months later with a different view of myself and the world and my past and my future, I thought I'd love to go through that with other people. So a load of years later, I started training it and working it and studying it, and now I'm a therapist for teenagers. Amazing, amazing. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk to Elaine in a second, um, but Richie, but we know you work together quite mm -hmm. often, so tell us about the work you do. Myself and Elaine, but one of the things I do, I, I do a module in my old secondary school, St. Benilda's up in Kilmacud, in mental fitness. It's all around mental health and emotional well-being and how to look after ourselves. And then myself and Elaine got talking a couple of years ago um, about, in, in my module, the whole area of, of, of of, of sex and porn and relationships and all these questions kept coming up um, and see like the giggles that get mentioned when you when, when you mention the word yeah. I was thought, okay we need to support young people in a in a way that we're not doing at the moment yeah. and I thought wouldn't it be great if we did a module and I knew Elaine had done a load of work and a load of research in this area so someone suggested that I contact Elaine and we just cobbled together a load of topic areas that we thought 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds and transition year students would benefit from exploring and discussing and being supported with. So every Friday afternoon, we co-deliver a module in sexual health. Amazing, amazing. We talked to Lee in a second, we're about that. Mm. Uh, just about yourself now, Shane. Um, we have big news for you to speak on the retirement. We'll come to that in a second, but first of all, to bring you right back. So we're talking Dublin GAA, days we're talking playing at the youth level. Uh, tell us what it was like, how you got there, and how you achieved it. Probably similar to, to Richie's story, obviously I went across to England at a young, very young age of 15 um, to a club called Littridge Town in the southeast of England. Um, was scouted back here playing for a schoolboy club, home farm and had a number of trials at clubs and was lucky enough to have a, have a couple of offers on the table at 14, 15 years of age and decided to go to Ipswich, lived the dream, I stayed over there for seven years altogether. Um, and I really enjoyed most of my time there, but at 22 I came to the decision that it wasn't for me anymore. Unlike Richie, um, it wasn't through injury, um, it was just a decision I made. I wasn't enjoying the game, the people that were around the game over there, so I decided to, to pack it in and, and come home. Uh, well, a year left on my contract, and it was the best thing I ever did. And got back straight into the GA, then went down to my local club, and again, that was a, a vital part of me integrating back into to life back in Dublin, I suppose, and ended up being involved in the, the Dublin panel in 2013, Jim Gavin's first year when they won the All-Ireland as well, and played Gaelic for a number of years and ended up back playing soccer somehow. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so again, Shane, yourself, soccer was a passion. Yeah. Again, you achieved huge, you got as far as Ipswich, you're working under Roy Keane. 
And you told, you're, you're saying that you decided you just didn't like it. Um, so why did you stop liking it? I suppose it was on the horizon for a while, about 17, 18 years of age, when I started to break into the first team in Ipswich. Been around the dressing room, saw the attitudes of players, and you know, weren't quite. Again, I was brought up in a, you know, a lot of a GA kind of a background, I suppose, in school and that. And you play for your team, and you know your club or your county, your school with your teammates, and you're all fighting for the same thing. Yeah. I didn't find that over there when I kind of got up the ladder. And obviously, money comes into it as well. There's a lot of lads on different wages in the dressing room, a lot of money, and they don't view the club in the way that. Maybe I viewed the club or I viewed the game. And I stayed around, went out to other clubs on loan to see where the attitude's different, and they weren't. And I just decided, like, this is, this is not for me. I'm not going to be happy staying here um, for another 15 years. I need to get out. And I made the decision. It wasn't a spur of the moment thing. It was something that was building up for a number of years. So It's funny you seem different to, to Richie. Richie really wanted to pursue this career, and unfortunately it was taken away from him. But you really had this, and you decided that it wasn't for you. Yeah. So that's an equally tough decision to make. Um, probably wasn't overnight, I'm imagining. No. But you did walk away from it, and now you're working as a life coach. So where did this shift in mentality come from for you? It took me a long while, because when I came back, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I wanted to join the guards. My dad was a, a detective. But at the time, I came back to 2009, it was at the height of the economic downturn. There was no recruitment for five years, so I had to look at other opportunities, worked a number of different jobs, which were great and gave me a lot of good life experiences as well. Um, and then I came across a life coach about three and a half, four years ago, and sat down, helped me put a bit of structure on you know, life and the direction I wanted to go and you know, my personality, what I'd be suited to, um, and just a different perspective on things. And I made a couple of decisions then, um, a lot of them around education, because at 15, I left after my junior cert, didn't have much education um, behind me, and was in fear of that um, for a long time and getting back into that, but I decided to throw myself back in at 28 years of age, and it was the best thing I ever did. Great. I want to talk more in a minute, um, lads, about an insight into what it's actually like playing and working at such a high level. I'm sure there's a lot of people out here who probably aspire to be there. So there was, I'm sure there was ups and downs about that. I'll come to that in a second, but just over to yourself now, Elaine. You're a doctoral researcher at the School of Psychology and NUIG. So first of all, are you a sports fanatic yourself? Absolutely not. <laughs> but I, mean, I, I can follow it, but I never, as Richie talked about, um, you know, when he was a teenager, sport was the most important thing in his life. I was um, always much more bookish. Um, I wasn't particularly sporty. And I remember just, just listening to the guys talking about sport, and I don't know if there are people in the room that can identify with this, I was always the last person to be picked for a team. You know, and, and that, listening to the guys now, that did impact on me and, and how I felt about myself. Um, now, the fact that I wasn't particularly good didn't come into it for me, but being the last one to be picked for a team, that I remember. Yeah. Um, but no, I wasn't. I wasn't at all yeah. sporty. But having said that, you are up here now with international panel. So there's a link Imposter here. Imposter syndrome, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there is a link here. Tell us a bit about the work that you do at the moment. Okay. Um, well, my research area of interest is in sexual behaviour and consent specifically. And um, I suppose when I started um, researching consent in 2014, I was talking to myself because there was no interest. We didn't have all that we've had over the last number of years that had, that had an explosion really in the media around the issue of consent. Um, so when I started first, um, the first thing I had to do was come up with a definition of consent because I was asked, what's the definition of consent? And my answer was, I don't know. I don't know. So I went to, there were so many different elements to it that I cobbled together a definition for myself that enabled me to understand what consent was. And my research initially was with um, third level students. And we conducted the largest survey of sexual behaviour and attitudes ever undertaken in this country. And that's something we didn't have data, we didn't have anything to tell us what people's behaviours were, what their attitudes were, until we did that survey. Um, and I did follow-up interviews then with students um, as part of it. And one of the questions I asked them was their experience of sex education at school. And um, for the most part, it, it was lacking. People felt that they were equipped with, one, one guy said, the bare necessities or the mechanics. Um, 
relationships weren't discussed, emotions weren't discussed, feelings weren't discussed, you know, in heteronormative situations, male-female situations, how the other person was feeling, how you were feeling, none of that was discussed. So when Richie and I, um, I was going to say hooked up, but that's kind of inappropriate. <laughs> it's a whole um, other story. <laughs> <laughs> a bit inappropriate. Any other phrase. Any other phrase. Yeah. But, because hooking up is a focus of my research yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but when we, when we started talking about, about a, a, a putting together a module um, in Benildus, one of the things that was really important to us was that we would focus on all of those things that weren't in the curriculum or that weren't being explored or discussed with young people. And another thing that was really, really important to us was that the module would be, as with the mental fitness module that, that, that Richie facilitates, is that it would be peer-led and really interactive. That it was really important to us to give the boys a voice, for them to discuss and for them to explore sex and sexuality in a really comfortable and a safe space. Mm -hmm. So that's how we came to, to develop the module. Yeah, I mean, you totally, I totally agree. I mean, just social media and TV in the current last 12 months, it's all about consent, and it wasn't for years. And I was thinking to myself, and I was like, you know, we obviously had a big high-profile incident in this country, in Northern Ireland, the last 12 months, which was dealing with sport and consent. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking to myself, you know, we had it in America too with the Me Too movement. So you're an expert in this field, Lily. Do you think this is an issue that is more prevalent in sport, equally as prevalent? What would your take on that be? Um, the issue of consent is a societal issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, what we've seen are high profile cases, whether they're in sport or whether they're in entertainment or whether they're in media. They've just brought the issue to the fore, but the reality is that the issue of consent or experience of non-consensual encounters for people, that's societal. And that's something that we really need to address at a societal level. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. And the importance of education at a younger and younger age because I was involved in the development of consent workshops at third level. And having facilitated those, I see like, they're really, really valuable and they're really, really useful and people get a lot out of them. But I think introducing the concept of consent at that stage mm -hmm. is too late. Mm -hmm. We need to have people understanding before they get involved in, in sexual relationships or sexual encounters to understand what it is what it really means and how finding themselves in a non-consensual situation can really impact them mm -hmm. and ensuring that they're not because they really, really understand what consent is. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Richie and Sheen, let's back to yourselves and to talk about the insight of sport at a high level. Um, what do you think, myself with yourself, Richie, are the main issues facing young people in sport who are trying to aspire to get this high level and those who are at a, at a lower level uh, today? Well, I suppose it, it depends on the sport. Um, I suppose in, in my own, in, in, in football, like it's not like if you, if you really want to get a college place, you know, if you get a certain amount of points, you, you're going to get it. And the, there might be some careers out there which have a defined pathway. You know, you get points, you get a degree, or a, get an internship, and it's set out for you. In, in football, it's different. It, they're, they're, it's not like that. You, you, mm. you can put a huge amount of work into it, and the vast majority of 12-year-olds who want to be a professional footballer, 99.999% of them won't. Now, a lot of them will, will put a huge amount of time and effort and emotional energy all the way up to 17 or 18 or 19 or 20 before they get to the point where they realize they're, they're just not at the level to make a career. And for a lot of those people, they can really find themselves in a lot of difficulty. The disappointment of it not working out and the lack of a of support to the lack of a plan B, a lack of alternatives, all of those things can be problematic. So for those who make it, um, and even the phrase make it means different things to different yeah. people. Um, but you will be under a hell of a lot of scrutiny, way more than teenagers would normally be in any other job. It's a public role. Um, there will be a lot of expectation, a lot of challenges, a lot of pitfalls. Um, there will be a lot of demands on you. Um, if you're a footballer, you will probably be given a lot of money very young. Mm -hmm. And not every young person mm -hmm. is very good with a lot of money. And a lot of, not every young person has, a, has what we would call healthy or stable um, support around them. Mm -hmm. So it can, be, it can be very difficult. And the world of professional sport, it's shark infested. There, there, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So you really need to be minded. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a, like for those... For, like the good days, as I said earlier, are phenomenal. 
Mm. Like I've certain memories of, of days or moments in training or matches or, you know, sitting with my parents or friends before or after games, which I kind of wouldn't swap for the world, but the, mm. the bad days then are equally challenging. So again, like I said earlier, you have to work out a way for yourself of how you deal with all the, the peaks and troughs along the way. And Shane, you yourself have been, well, have been involved up until this week because you just retired. Yes. <laughs> Nick, that deserves a bit of a round of applause because congratulations to the amazing career. <laughs> I'm a, a little bit sad because it's earlier than I, I wanted to retire, yeah. to be honest. Um, yeah. I feel I'm still young, especially from my position as a goalkeeper. I wanted to go on yeah. you know, a lot longer, yeah. but um, due to injury, I've, you know, it's the best decision for me yeah. to step away now, long term, from my, from my health, um, unfortunately. But it's, you know, I look back on my career now and I have great memories and you know, I'm glad and I'm proud of the career I had. Yeah. And just to, to focus on the fact that you have been involved, you know, we go back to Ipswich, which is a few years ago, you've been involved up until this year. Um, how do you feel, how have you found that mindset has changed, the challenges have changed in the last, we say, three or four years? I mean, the world is a different place now. With social media, probably in particular, I mean, it's revolutionised everything for the good or for the bad. It's got pros and cons. So you've been, you've been playing really at a high level before this happened and now. So how have you personally found, or have you found any difference in the challenges faced? Not per personally, really, um, but I do notice it around the dressing room now, um, and the guys, the younger guys that are coming through, and what they're having to deal with, having been brought up in this technology age, I suppose, um, with Instagram and Snapchat, and um, it is, it's a different world, and like, I was only talking to one of the guys the other day about it, you know, going away on away trips um, up to Derry, and there's two young guys, and they're sitting beside each other, on their phones, haven't spoke a word. Yeah. I, I get up and I went over to them and said, have you open your mouth teacher yet? You know, yeah. they, they're not developing the skills that are needed as well to cope, the people skills, the, the meaningful relationships, you know, that, that mm. you need in sport. Um, and again, a lot of it, from what Richie's saying as well, listen to it, is the support people around you, you know, and, and the role models around you, um, whether it's family or, you know, older teammates or people you, looked up, you look up to. A lot of these guys, they see the lads in the Premier League and they're putting stuff up on Instagram yeah. and, and Twitter and they think that's real life, they don't realise a lot of the work that's gone in to get them there as well. Mm -hmm. So I think, our game is, is losing a lot of good leadership um, in terms of the players that are going out of the game um, and then the young guys coming through. Um, they don't have the same leadership qualities that are needed to, to show these lads the way, really. And it is a different, and I'm not up on all the, the technology. I'm, I'm on yeah. a couple of social media platforms, but I'm not active on it. So yeah. I know it's, it's difficult and there's a lot of pressure on, on the younger generation now. And just very briefly as well, Shane, on that point, I mean, we look at the likes of Twitter, particularly, I suppose, I mean, and when you're playing at the level that you are, your colleagues and friends are being scrutinised constantly, and it's very hard to ignore that unless you come off it, which is also very hard to do. Yeah. Uh, and we're not a big social media fan yourself, but what would would you have any tips or advice for people uh, and for young people here to kind of overcome this constant social media interrogation? I just be careful what they, what they're putting up. Like, and even the guys that I, I play when I speak to them, and like, it's great putting stuff up on the good days when you've had a good result or you've scored a goal and. You know, you're getting all the adulation from the from the fans, but then there's going to be days when that's not mm -hmm. going to happen. And how are you going to deal with that? So just, I think, thinking about those days and reflecting on, you know, and these scenarios when they do come up, and, and being prepared for it. If you are going to be active on social media, there are going to be times there's going to be idiots as well that yeah. want to have a, you know, a pop at you from behind the keyboard, unfortunately. So it's just, I think, if we can educate the guys. Or the likes of what Richie and Elaine are doing is, is vital, I think, um, going forward, especially in sport, because um, it's, a, it's a big problem in sport. Yeah. I'm really glad, actually, it wasn't around when I played, because, dur again, during the bad spells, when, when things aren't going, I, I don't know what it would be like to turn on Twitter or something and see hundreds or thousands of people ripping you to shreds. I don't think at a young age it yeah. would have developed the wherewithal just, just, to, just to keep scrolling past them and not have any emotional reaction yeah. whatsoever. Just to go, yeah, whatever, whatever. I can do that now, but mm. I'm, I'm nearly 40. Like when I, if yeah. I was 17 or 18 and there was a, I was going on any kind of platform where there was a load of people making personal remarks or cutting remarks or, or slagging me, I don't know if that would be a healthy place for me to have been back then, but it's... Um, mm -hmm. Again, people have to work out their own way of, of interacting with it. It can be a really healthy thing, it can connect people, it can be, it can be brilliant in a load of scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, and there are kind of less safe, reckless ways of using it as well. Uh, Lena, in your field, which is consent, um, 
would you say social media has been a friend or a foe to kind of awareness of consent? I mean, I know myself, when you really look at the cases we talked about and the awareness, I've got most of mine from Facebook, to be honest, mm. and I'm looking at the stories, and my news feed is actually now my main news tool, which I know is dodgy in itself, but at the same time, it, it kind of is my, my go-to. So, are you a fan of social media then? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and during the, the trial that you're referring to last year, I followed what was effectively trial by social media. Yeah. Um, I followed that religiously, but didn't engage with any of it. And I, that's something that, that as, as Richie has said, and, and Shane, is really, really important, that you can engage, but to try and or make a really good effort to detach yourself from what can be relentless negativity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, as I said, I did follow, but it was really important for me not to engage. There were a number of of tweets I saw that I could have jumped in and said, that's incorrect, or, yeah. you know. But you, you really mm -hmm. have to... Pull yourself back from that. And the other thing with, with social media as well is that, particularly with Instagram, and I suppose I, I, as a female, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say addicted, but I use Instagram a lot, um, is that people are uploading the best of themselves. And if we're sort of measuring ourselves against the best of others, of course we're going to feel inadequate, of course we're going to feel inferior. But just to be, to be kind of cognizant that that's the best that that person has to offer. And I don't need to measure up to that, but that's something that takes years to learn and there, you know, it's trial and error. But certainly Richie has been really helpful for me in, I'd, I'd look at something on my social media and go, oh my God, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? Just swipe, swipe, yeah. swipe, just ignore it. Yeah. Ignore the negativity and engage with the positivity. Yeah, skill in itself. Absolutely, you know? yeah. absolutely. Yeah. We're going to open up the floor to you guys in a second, so if you have any questions, keep it in your head. But I want to end on a positive note because we do have two professional, hugely professional sports people in our, in our midst. So I just want to ask, uh, I suppose, a sports reader question to yourself, and it might be a particular uh, interest to those of us out here who might be aspiring to achieve some, something near that. Um, what are your tips on maintaining a professional mindset when you are training or aspiring to train at such a high level, Richie? tips to maintain a professional mindset. Um, w one of the things I used to think you had to do to make it to the top was to be blinkered. So in my case it was football. So just focus on football and nothing else. Develop no other interests or no other side hobbies or anything. And the more and more young people I started to work with, or the more and more young footballers as I started to see, I realized that actually this one dimensional approach to developing yourself as a person isn't actually that healthy. Whether you end up in a career or not, you're at some point going to leave the career. No one is a professional footballer until they're 90 years of age. So at some point, you're going to have to live in a world where you're not an athlete in your chosen sport. So I, I don't think most elite athletes need to be encouraged to train hard mm -hmm. or to make the sacrifices or to monitor their diet or their sleep. They just do that. But I think the advice that I would like to have been given when I was 17 or 18 was just to allow room for other interests to develop. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make me less committed footballer. It doesn't mean I have less chance of doing well. It just means I have a bit more rounded, healthier approach to life. Because you can only train mm. a couple hours a day. Yeah. You're still going to be awake for another 10 or 12 hours. Yeah. So sitting on a couch watching MTV for 10 hours a day, as it was for me back then, there's a better way of spending your time yeah. than that. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. And Shane is supposed to the GAA, and it's one thing that everyone always talks about the GAA. Like, you're, you guys are, are performing and training at a hugely professional level, uh, yet your guards, your teachers, your nurses, you're working in shops during the day. So you're on a, a national stage, international stage weekends, training in evenings. You're widely known throughout the land, yet you have very ordinary lives. Uh, I always have wondered how you, you can cope with that, how you actually can go from like, is, 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 there, is there two different personalities and you do detach yourself? What would be your tips, particularly in the GAA, of maintaining this professional kind of ethos? I suppose a lot of it, and again, coming from the soccer, you know, lifestyle into the GAA lifestyle was a little bit of a shock because in soccer, like Richie's saying, you just throw yourself into it every day. So I did anyway, and a lot of lads do, especially when you're trying to make it um, to the top is it's so intense and that's all you think about and you know you're trying to do everything you can and I did all sorts outside of even training to you know help my game and whether that was yoga or pilates or you know other things I was told this will help you this will help you but when you come back 
and those things aren't kind of on the table for you because you're trying to manage a job and then your training schedule and you know it's it's time management really and that's yeah. what I learned from the, from the GA was how to manage my time mm. properly and um, to get the best out of myself when yeah. I did perform on a Saturday or a Sunday in the GA so um, and that's something I wouldn't have bought into when I was playing yeah. in England and like this goal setting as well was has been very um, important to me in the last number of years in my game as well and, and, and improving my game I think as well which is something I would have brushed, yeah. brushed off years ago so just time management and how to manage your time yeah. and, and not you know pull yourself everywhere. And speaking mentally uh, I suppose you went from Richie's lifestyle to professional football in the UK which was your all encompassing job you weren't totally happy with it for a number of reasons you're, you went back to the GAA, so there was something that drew you back. Would you say that that uh, lifestyle and kind of career path grounded you more over here? The fact that you were able to just leave it behind on a Sunday and focus on something else. Was that actually a positive for you? Yeah, definitely. And it was something that was always kind of in me, even in England. Like, I was frustrated at the time. It's because I didn't always want to be just known as a footballer. I wanted to be known as, you know, something else. Or, yeah. you know, or chain the, the person or whatever. And that was, I didn't really understand it then. And as I came home, I started to understand it more. That's, that's what I wanted. I wanted to detach myself away from that as well. Mm -hmm. I wanted that, but I wanted to be someone else at the same time. So the GA definitely, you know, helped me um, to develop that side of, of my of my life as well. Yeah. There's loads of things I want to ask you guys, but I want to give yourselves a chance now. Um, if any pressing questions for any of our panel, what you could do is put your hand up or stand up. Uh, this is just a question for Elaine. Um, I know you just discussed about consent um, and where uh, we did a survey where the Irish second level students, you know, we did a survey of like 800 students. We found that 65% 65 65% of them found had no um, education on consent at all during RSC. Um, and there's a debate at the moment, should relationship and sexuality education be taught by teachers or should it be taught by trained professionals coming in? And I just wanted to get your own opinion on that. Well, actually, there's, um, there's for and against for both, right? Um, that some students um, value RSE being delivered by their teachers with whom they're familiar. Others feel more comfortable with people like Richie and I who aren't part of the, the teacher body coming into secondary schools to deliver um, RSE. But the issue for us isn't how it's delivered. The issue is that it's delivered. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that's really important to, to me, certainly. Is, um, and it's something that's so frustrating, is the lack of consistency with the delivery of RSE. Like we can have, I know we have a review of the curriculum, we can have the best curriculum in the world, but if it's not being delivered, regardless of who's delivering it, then what's the point? What's the point? But I know for us, um, certainly, there is huge support in the school for us coming, as, as externs coming in, delivering the RSE, and I think the, the boys as well appreciate it. It's a very, very different relationship the relationship they have with Richie both in mental fitness and they have with Richie and I in, in the sexual health module than they have with their teachers. And I think it's very, very difficult, and this is just me personally, I think it's very, very difficult for a teacher to sort of moonlight as a sexual health educator and bring what we bring to a module like that that's very peer-led, very interactive, very informal, and then to go back to being an authoritarian figure as a geography teacher or a history teacher, I think that's a very great challenge for them as well. So basically, I think when it's the high profile games, um, how do you deal with the pressures for that, Richie? Like, you know, when, it's, when it really is at a higher stage? When you're, when you're involved in sport at a very high level and there's a lot of people watching. Particularly higher games than the bigger games, you know? Do, do you know what I think the best uh, approach is? Is to, if you get, and it's not easily done by, by everyone, it's just to approach every game like, I, I was a centre forward, so there were certain things that would be demanded of me in every single game. Certain moves I had to make, certain things I would want to achieve on a pitch. And so I would aim to do that, irrespective of the level of importance of the game, or how many people was watching, or whether it was on telly or not, um, or whether it was a friendly, or whether it was a cup final. And just to try and focus on the job rather than the external environment. Um, because I found my own self, when I started to listen to what the crowd were, are the crowd singing my name or are they booing me? Or I started to listen to any other external cues, I lost focus on the thing that I was there to do and I did it less well. So for me, I had to learn the hard way that actually just focusing on the job, my specific job, was the best way to be 
a, a good footballer. And that if I started to focus on how many people are in the stands or how many people are watching on TV, I just lost focus. Yeah. But other people will give you a different answer. They say, do you know what, the more people who watch me and the more people who are talking about me, the, the, the more that inspires me to do as well as I can be. So it's a kind of a personal thing. But for me, it was just forget the external stuff. Hone in on the opinions of a few people who matter. My coach, my teammates, and that's it. And that's a skill that took me a little while to learn. All right. Thanks for your question. We have time for just one more, I'm being told, actually, unfortunately. This, we have a very keen young man over here. Uh, my name's Luke, and uh, I have a question for Richie. Did you see the social media reaction that about you when uh, RT put up that you scored in you know, the under-18s European third round qualifier? And I just want to ask, how do you feel about that social media reaction? It, it was hard not to be aware of the reaction, to be honest. Um, so for anyone who don't know, I, I, I worked in a Champions League programme one night. I think it was a Barcelona-Arsenal match or something. I don't think it mattered who the team was. But at the start of every programme, to introduce whoever's on the screen to the audience, they'll put your name and something interesting about you below. And usually it's former Ireland international, former Mar something bland. But one lad one night who had the job to do that dipped into... The, he looked at all the various ways I've been described over the years. And I think, as a joke, one of the lads who was a producer on one of the League of Ireland highlight shows put that up years ago. And it was grand, it was funny. It was kind of relevant even actually to the conversation tonight because we were talking about youth international tournaments. So your man saw it and says, oh, OK, well, just I'll put this on. And of course, then Twitter erupted. Um, I didn't, I didn't mind at all. I, I, I was totally indifferent, and I, I, I like the fact that it brought so much joy to so many people. Um, <laughs> but the, the goal itself, that 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 under that third place playoff, it was the under 18 European Championships. I was 17. It was the first time I started a game for Ireland, which was the highlight of my life at that point, and it was the first goal I scored for Ireland, which put us one 0 up against Spain. Now we lost the game 2-1. But I remember the feeling I had after that goal it w was probably the greatest feelings I've had, probably, certainly at that point, but I don't know if I've had many better since. So I like that the, the caption has, has amused so many people, but I love the memories I have about the moment as well. Great. OK, I've been told to wrap it up, so we're back here at 12 o'clock for another panel, guys. Huge thanks to Lane Burns, Richard and Shane Supple.